uh, on record here doing what we what we're supposed to do. Okay, so what I did, guys, I brought with me a couple of things. Um, let me go back to my presentation. Uh, before I start, um, being an engineer, we look at things differently because we are, especially those of us who are engineers, we are used to a lot of IEEE standards when it comes to the medium voltage. So what I thought that to find a cross-reference between MEC code book 111 and what we're used to as an engineer with all these IEEE readings that we, what, what, that we design. So for those of you who are interested, especially in the cross crossover, I've, uh, I found, I came across a book, I don't know how many of you guys have this book. It's called Lineman and Cableman, a uh, handbook for Lineman and Cableman. Down to earth explanation. If you ever wondered why do they go multiple ground, why do they ground the news from multiple points in a utility? And what's the advantage of all these bonding and grounding in a utility work? This is one of the best manuals that I found, hands on manual, not engineered, more mechanical and efficient. So I, I, I don't work for the company, but I really strongly strongly encourage this one, guys. Um, I am dated here, but I. Uh, I'm way a couple of cycles before, but National Electric Safety Code, guys, this is also our Bible when they did the utility work. That's what we use again. I'm dated, this is old version, 2012 this year, so I don't want to even show you the date on that one. But um, if you're in the medium voltage, you need a National Electric Safety Code. That's your one. I'll show you the new version of that one, a copy of it. And uh, some of us in the electrical industry are not good enough, and they love the NEC code book a lot, so they collect them. I do collect National Electric Code books, guys. This is the oldest one that I have, 1914. Um, and so I have a full set down to the 60s. Um, I wanted to bring them today, but it's a big box. So, anyway, so there's some really good stuff. Just give you an idea. This is 19, uh, 1940. This is, I don't know, I don't think anyone of you guys was around. That's 1897. The first code ever adopted in the US, National Electric Code. And it's, um, anyone who can have it, and I don't work for the company, and that's NFTA, they sell it for $83 or something, TVL5. Really interesting to go there and look at it. So I thought to start with these. Uh, Sorry, guys, I'm not going to be able to do that. Uh, so it's really nice to look at. Uh, there was uh, no medium voltage in this one, nothing. So that's uh, just quick introduction before we guys go ahead and. Um, I do this presentation because I have 188. <laughs> Slides, so it's long. Uh, here's what I can. I don't have handouts for you. If you're interested, I will leave uh, my business cards here. P I will PDF it to you for no cost. Is that cool? If anybody's interested in what we're doing, guys, uh, drop me an email. I will make sure that you get it as a PDF. Okay. Um, again, when you guys are, gosh, the, the yellow is, is is nasty on the white. When you when you Deal with NEC code book again. There's a lot of a lot of codes for the high voltage and the medium voltage. But in the NEC code book, they divide almost all the high voltage are at the end of the article. So if you're looking for something when you the for example solar system higher than 600 volts, there is a solar system higher than 600 volts, and they put it way at the end of the the, the article that talks about the wind, the solar system. Same thing for wind. If you're looking for wind higher than 600 volts. They also look at the, the shifting way at the end of the chapter. So everything is divided in the code based, based on 600 volt or less and uh, more than 600 volt. Uh, that's voltage wise. Conductor wise, I don't know, I'm sure a lot of you guys involved in the in the medium voltage, otherwise, or interested, in, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Conductor wise, so voltage wise, 600 or less, more than 600. Conductor wise, if you go to 310.15B16, uh, she used to be 310.16, right? So if you guys go there, the conductors are, the table can give you amps up to 200, 2,000 amps. I don't know how many of us have ever paid attention to the 2,000 amps at the top. So they divide the conductors to 2,000 amps and low, I mean 2,000 volts and low conductor-wise, and higher than, uh, um, higher than 2,000. So that's another div division that you can, you're looking at right here um, in terms of voltage, for the conductor. So there's voltage division for the system and there's voltage division for the conductors, which is really interesting. Um, anything higher than um, cable wise, higher than uh, 2001, they have set of cables, set of, of, of tables that we use guys. And all these tables are in a different location. So they have the 600 volt 
cutoff, and they have a 2,000 volt cutoff for the cables. And if that's not enough for you, there's also grounding and bonding. There's another cutoff, another voltage cutoff for grounding and bonding. They cut it by 1,000 volt, 1,000 volt um, up to a one higher than 1,000 volt and 1,000 volt or less. That's how they cut it off for grounding and bonding. Um, also, you guys are familiar with SPDs, uh, surge protective devices. Surge protective devices, they cut them the same thing, a uh, 1,000 or less, that's called the surge protective device. Higher than 1,000, they call it surge resistors, and you guys are very familiar if you are in the medium voltage industry and high voltage, you are very familiar with this, uh, with this um, um, surge resistors. So I thought just to share with you these voltage mismatches, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, it's because they're related to do the, too many industries, guys. There's a cable industries and, and grounding and, and um, as well as the system. So anybody have any comments about this mismatch with the voltages? So, but the code defined though, the code defined high volt, anything higher than 600 volt as a high voltage, the NEC code book. But if you're looking for grounding and bonding, remember you are grounding and bonding things higher than a thousand volt. If you're looking at equipment, equipment six, uh, higher than 600 volt. So just to give you these a couple of limitations um, on the voltages. Any comments, guys? Anybody want to comment? The ones who are doing medium voltage in that one? Yes, sir. Isn't there a ceiling with a medium voltage cable of 2001 that it goes up to what? At the 2000. Um, the cable wise goes up to 35 at 35. least in any sequence book. Yeah. Higher than 35, you're on your own as far as the NEC code book required. Higher than 35K. Uh, 35, uh, yeah, 35 gear. But they make cable. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They make cable. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, cables oh, up to 2 million volt. You can buy cables, I believe, that they put between for utilities. And, uh, oh, now you're getting me into the wa water cooled. Come, I want to refer you to this one. <laughs> there's a lot of water cooled cable guys. They use, there's a project, anybody, I don't want to go all the way to the high voltage. The project that's been connecting South and um, connecting Spain to Africa, and they're using a cable, interesting cable, connecting the North African grid with your grid under. The Mediterranean Sea. That would be so. It, it's it's a whole different uh, different animal when it comes to the high voltage. Okay, um, for the code doesn't go even there. That's a whole different different animal. I thought, guys, um, because of very clear with the low voltage and how the electricians and some of us the engineers who don't have experience of the high voltage thing. I thought I list all the places. These are all the location in the NEC code book that there are substantial amount of information about high voltage. Again, these are not the only places, but these are the places that have substantial amount of information about the, NEC, uh, the higher than 600 volt. So I start with the um, introduction, a few things. Definition for high voltage fuses and circuit breakers, cutoffs, and, um, and a couple of um, overcurrent friction devices. Uh, general requirement, we'll talk a couple of things guys, about general requirements in terms of clearances as you walk in the front of a medium voltage switch gear. That's a big deal in the NEC code book. We are familiar with the low voltage switch gear, right? We're also familiar with that one. So then, uh, believe it or not, there's something called brand circuit. It, if, you, if you're not familiar with medium voltage, a brand circuit means to a lot of electricians a, a 15 amp circuit or a 50 amp circuit. There is a brand circuit, medium voltage brand circuit, um, as, as in the brand circuit defined as the, right, the, the cables between the utilization equipment and the last overcompletion device. So that's that's what they define the, the uh, brand circuits. There's the feeders. And then and so these are the stuff that I picked, guys, from the, all these areas. Then, of course, if you're outdoor, especially medium voltage, outdoor becomes a big deal. Feeders and branch circuit and services. Overcompletion device and grounding, arresters. Um, these are also substantial information. We're going to spend some time, guys, and I know I have two hours. I have a lot of information for two hours, but we'll spend some time sizing a medium voltage cable. And lately, lately, overhead high over 600 volt uh, conductor article. I don't know if you guys noticed in 2011, there's a whole new article that talks about um, conductors, overhead conductors, but the conductors are rated for over 600 volt. Basically, utility work. I um 
I don't know if you guys do your camera work. This is also dated material, but I think anybody have seen this or use this? If you do, you tell it to work. I'm sure they have different forms. This is an old one. I haven't done the for a while. It tells you work. That's what we did then when we built the uh, distribution lines, basically poles, wood poles, and we'll attach all these insulators on them and the ACSR cables on them. This is the Bible from Hoover. I'm sure they still do it too. Um, so that will get you, if you want to design um, a, a distribution system like this, will get you the distances between the phase A, phase B, phase C, as well as the neutral. So anyway, the reason why I brought this with me, because we have a brand new article that's called the out, uh, Outdoor Overhead Conductors Over 600 Volt. That's exactly what utilities do for distribution systems. So that's, that's also another Bible in that particular industry. Um, a lot of us guys, if, you, if you're an electrical contractor, you do hospitals, sport arenas, uh, campuses, you probably very familiar with the medium voltage, because that's what you bring to your substation. If you have a substation, uh, you bring your 13A to one section of your switch gear, your transformer will be in the middle, and from the other side, you're going to have a 48277 uh, your distribution system. So, medium voltage and sizing medium voltage becomes a big, big deal, I believe. Um, a couple of things is about uh, motors and transformers and uh, equipment over 600 volt, as in switch gear, switch boards, and so forth. So, these are a few things. Um, I grabbed, the, I'm sure if you guys are familiar with the medium voltage, most likely, and I have some colleagues here, they're familiar with the SKM. This is directly from SKM. The reason why I grabbed this one, unfortunately, my SKM license expired, so I have to renew it. Uh, I wanted to walk you guys there. Just to give you the gravity of where you start with the medium voltage in terms of over competition device and so forth. So that section over here starts from the utility, that section could be 69K in terms of voltage, all these relays, protection um, on the transmission line, all the way down to another distribution transformer that gets you down to, uh, say, 13.8, and another distribution, uh, two voltages that get you maybe 4160 in one side, and another, uh, I want to say 600 volt. I don't think they make them, though. So that's kind of the section where, where, you, where, where the high voltage part. The rest of it, and you can have a high voltage uh, uh, motors or synchronous machines, synchronous equipment tied to it. The reason why I brought this one because when it comes to the medium voltage sizing conductors, the forward end is the last thing in your mind. It's always a short circuit. You size it different place on the short circuit. A huge amount of energy could burn your equipment. So short circuit becomes a big deal. This is a short circuit study uh, taken from, I didn't do it, taken from MSKM that gives all these numbers that you can see here. The available short circuit, three phase and line to line going a different direction inside your plant from the high voltage all the way down to the low voltage systems here. I thought just to get you an idea of that one, here's a, I blew that one a little bit up here. So from the utility all the way down here, that's probably down into the whole system um, with all the relays um, that's supposed to protect you from, these are over, um, over current protection relays. So that just give you a, a, an idea how a one-line diagram would look like when we design it as an engineer, when we do a short circuit analysis on them, um, load flow analysis and so forth. So it's more, um, the code doesn't go even there. It just tells you you have to pay a lot of attention when you size cables for medium voltage in terms of sizing them not to be burned in case of a short circuit or a ground fault in the feeder. So that's the main, that's all what they tell you. How to do it. There's a couple of things. Softwares are a great opportunity. I'll show you a, an overcurrent protection coordination. Again, all the stuff that I showed you right now is not in the NDC code book. These are engineering wise. What would we do if we have a system like this? We lay it out with cables. We run a short circuit analysis in it, load flow analysis in it. We put our relays, we set our relays, and, um, and, and that's our start point for cable sizing and equipment sizing and so forth. Okay, so that's, uh, that's just a quick. Uh, a quick review. Um, because I'm going to be jumping around, guys, in terms so I can get into what, what I would need to. The purpose of the NEC code book is um, the safeguard of the people. This is just I grabbed a couple of things. Safety is the, is the main reason. Um, a friend of mine um, always say Tim Forrest, this is something that's around here. This is a part of all the low voltage uh, uh, presentations. I always say, it, or it, as engineers, the NEC code book is your reference zero. So 
how how you can go higher than in super bucket, how good of a design project you can do. And I hope I'm talking for a lot of engineers here. Um, but lately when I start doing contracting work and people don't pay us for what we do, I start thinking it's almost you have to have the happy medium between a great design project and and how much are the, the, the clients are willing to pay for. So, but if I have my choice as an engineer, I will always go much, much higher than what the NEC code book um, allows you to do. Because when we talk about safety, no future expansion uh, for the most part um, in, um, in the mind of uh, the NEC code and so forth. And the most important thing I always say, guys, um, I always use my, myself as a trader. I, uh, I go to Jerusalem. I have a national official license and registration here. I came 15 years ago to the US. And I thought, big hit is engineer, what's the mass efficient that you have, right? So I said, I read this book and it merged in 1996 from A to Z. I scored 65. And if you go to a mess, I have to see a lot, a lot of mess, so you need 70. So because I thought, you know, it says yes, an untrained person, if you're not familiar with the, with the industry, you're not going to be able to, by reading this book, it's not going to get you there. So later on, I. I did a couple of courses, educated myself. So that's where this becomes very, very big deal then. And you see cookbook is not design specification or instruction manual for untrained people. That's where we send people to industry for training, for schools, and so forth. So I thought this is a big deal. The reason why I brought this one here is because you're jumping here in the medium voltage. This presentation will not make, if you're not familiar with the medium voltage, you need to do a lot of, a lot of uh, training, safety training. And I encourage you, if you're an electrical contractor, to read this. I know it's big, uh, but it's a really, really good reading about <laughs> a lot of stuff that you, you wonder how they do things in the utility. It's unreal. From a hands-on, not from an engineer, from a hands-on point of view. Okay, so um, I had a couple of things, guys, also since we're talking about high voltage. Uh, don't think that we are going to go head-to-head -head with, with the utility right now. The NEC was book. Does, then our NEC code book does not apply to the utility stuff. So I thought um, it applies to the building where they house their the offices for Excel Energy, but not to the utility work where they have their substation and metering communication. You guys are familiar with this from the low voltage, but I thought to bring it just in case because you think we're doing medium voltage now, we're going to do Excel Energy's work. Um, utilities are sacred cows. We, we don't want to mess with them. And these are a couple of all these guys. I want to just jump right through it. Um, utilities do their work, does not adhere to the NDC code book. I did utility work, guys, with our company. Um, we help the utilities do their work for a small, for small, small town. And I remember clearly, even though we don't adhere to the NDC code book, I used it for the low voltage. You have a substation, right? And you have a distribution system, 13 to 69 coming in, and you have 13 amps, and then you can take all these 13 states all over. But you have lights there, right? In the substation. You have receptacles, convenient receptacles. So I use the NEC code book to kind of give me an idea, sizing the grant circuit 15 and 20 amp, and you have fan and so forth. Um, so just keep in mind, but the, the thing that directly related to uh, the distribution generation, distribution transmission of power is not under the jurisdiction of the NEC code book. Here's your new Bible. Anybody has this? This is the National Electric Safety Code book. Anybody have a copy of this one, guys? Lisa, you have? You, you guys are up to date, so you have to borrow yours one day. <laughs> So this is the newest and the greatest um, the Bible for the NEC code book. If you're not familiar with it, guys, and I wish they use a word other than safety because it, uh, for, for people who are nothing with a high voltage, safety indicates it's related to the safety, but, which is, it is really, but it has a lot of design criteria that we use as engineers, as an electrician. For example, you have um, extensive overhead, outdoor clearances from distances and so forth. And the NEC code book, every time you read the NEC code book, guys, about clearances, you look at the bottom, especially high voltage, they always refer to it. Yeah, right now they're referring to 2007 in the in NEC code 2011. So I thought that's a, that's a book worth buying if you are in the, um, in the design or construction of the medium voltage. Any comments, guys? Any comments? Any? I can talk forever. We're instructors, so we, we, they pay us to talk. So. Please stop us, <laughs> stop me at any time. Um, there's so many uh, standards, guys, before we get into when it comes to the medium voltage or even the low voltage, guys. ANSI standards for switch gears, big deal. Um, IEEE has tons of standards about relay sitting, 
um, directional over competition device, differential relays, um, all these um, over under voltage, over under frequencies, naming for the relays that we use. So these are tons of information that you can get. Um, for those of you who are experts, I'm sure you guys can share much more with me than I have. For those of you who are beginners, email me and I'll send you a couple of names of things, probably a good start. Uh, for example, you can't start without uh, a document that uh, I found online actually free. Uh, a document that identify all the relays, the, the protection for the system. A 52 uh, a medium voltage circuit breaker. Um, so what is it? 51 is over temperature device. 51G is uh, a ground over temperature device for a ground. These are, you see them on every plant. And if you're an electrician, you'll see 52. What the heck is a 52? What is 52? When I start the medium voltage, that was the, the, the first thing that I have to clear, first of all. What are, what are all these numbers mean? There's a really nice high quality document that clear this one for you. Uh, over under frequency, the number that they use for under over, over under frequency, over under voltage, um, ground, um, protection, as well as overcurrent. So these are big deal IEEE standards that you probably, and you all also have tons of information about testing equipment and so forth. I was, uh, I don't know if you guys, they were giving these free today. I don't know if you've ever seen that in the UL. It was really interesting. You can reference these. So I picked it up, I had an old one, and I referenced a couple of medium voltage stuff here. So it reference switch gear, ANSI switch gear. You want to know which UL document talk about ANSI switch gear. You go to the NEC reference with UL and give you the reference about the ANSI switch gear. Really cool. They were giving it for free today. So. Make sure you grab one at the UL booth today. So that's a really nice document to have. Okay. Um, so with, you guys are familiar with the, with the chapter, chapter uh, article 100. Because some of us don't have a whole lot of, I don't have life. So uh, my sister lives in England. I went there. And the first thing I bought, I bought a British code book. You know, to talk about WAPO, huh? So I read the book, it's a tiny little book like this, and it's so confusing to me. And I thought, why, why was it easy for me to understand any secret book for the most part? And it was hard for me to understand the BSI standards. And I think, I, personally, I think because they did not have, at least the books I have, and I don't claim to be expert in it, they don't have the definitions. So you have an air conductor. Okay, is this an, an air phase conductor? No. Do you mean the grounding electrode conductor? In my mind, do you mean the equipment grounding conductor or the grounded conductor, or do you even care? <laughs> so that's uh, the reason why I give this story, guys, because if you want to understand any secret book, your start point should be Article 100. Understand the difference between a grounded conductor, grounding conductor, grounding electrode conductor in terms of grounding. Um, what's the voltage to ground? How the code define the voltage to ground? Because there's a lot of equipment that are sized based on the voltage to ground. Because of this, and I'm not going to go over all of them, guys. When I compare the high voltage, we're not talking about low voltage, high voltage definitions to the low voltage definitions, almost all of them, first it's shy, not a whole lot of them, second, they're all related for the most part to the overcurrent protection, overcurrent protection, protection for equipment. So being, I know a few things about protection for medium voltage, I ask myself, well, how about the over voltage, under voltage, frequencies, and so forth? You wouldn't find under over voltage, under over frequency, directional over temperature device, uh, differential relay, definitions in any sequence. So forget about that when you're able to find it. So they define a few things, guys, like uh, electro uh, electronically actuated fuses as an over competition device. You can see that this module, um, the, when we talk about overcompetition device, I'm sure you guys are familiar with one thing. The synth, we sense the current, two types of current we sense. We sense the load current, and we interrupt the load current. These are the load interrupters. And we sense the fault current, and, and or, so we don't, we're not all the time we interrupt, and we interrupt the fault current. So there's load interrupters, and there's fault interrupters. So this guy has the ability to, with a time current. It's always within a time current curve. I'll show you a couple of time current curves. It's not enough to interrupt the current. You have to interrupt the current at a certain value, 50 kilo amp, and or how, how fast you interrupt the current. So the, as we all know, the same thing in the low voltage, guys. I squared T, huge amount of energy. You leave, you square the time, and you multiply it by the current. That's how much, 
how much heat you're going to leave in your switch gear before a big ball of fire is going to come out of it. So the time current becomes a big deal. So those guys interrupt at two levels. They interrupt at the level of the ground for uh, um, a load level as well as um, an overcome picture, as well as a um, short short circuit level. Um, this is another thing that they find a fuse. You guys are familiar with the fuse? Um, it heated. This is just uh, probably the most simple things that you can interrupt uh, in terms of short uh, short circuit interruption in a medium voltage. A fuse it blows up and you interrupt the circuit versus a circuit a medium voltage um, vacuum circuit breaker or oil. So that's typically what you're going to be seeing in um, in, in it heated and severes the passage of the current to interrupt the short circuit, to interrupt the short circuit. So, and then they talk to us about vented, the way they interrupted them, vented and unvented. They, it's all about the material, how they, um, so for controlled discharge of the, of the current interruption, such that no solid material, in this case, you don't want any solid material to spill and create fire for you um, into the surrounding. So just, and these are directly from the code, and I'm not going to go over all of them, but these are, and I grabbed a couple pictures that could be what they meant here. Um, we have the, the explosion fuse unit, the E unit, the E fuses. These are a big deal, guys. Big explosion happen, and between, here's what, uh, so explosion effect, the gas, so you have, you end up, uh, say, 10,000 amp at 30 days. That, that big explosion that is going to happen into you is going to create the gas. The gas uh, produced by the arc, and so you, you, the whole idea is how are you going to uh, extinguish that um, the arc? If you guys are familiar with, the, uh, unlike in the low voltage, we're 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 really concerned about well, we're really concerned about the energy. In the high voltage guys, even if you have off the road, there's a big big cap arc that's going to hit hit you. So most of the overconnection devices are distinguished from each other in the way they extinguish this arc, either that's coming from interrupting a load or from interrupting a short uh, a short circuit current, which is a load, a low volt, a low amp current, and a short circuit is going to be a high high amp current. So all these guys in the ways of they interrupted the code, interrupted the current. Uh, Non-vented allows it to escape in the air, and I'm moving through these guys. So these are the definitions I'm going to find in the code. All of them, if you look at them, they're all related to what? Current interruption, safety, current interruption. Um, okay, so this is another fuse that you could use, power use, unit fuses, um, vented power fuses too. And I, I highlight all these guys for you. And multiple fuses, you can uh, have multiple fuses in one set tied together to in parallel and so forth. And then, so all these are different type of fuses. If you're, if you're interested, guys, Busman and a bunch of other guys get you tons of information about which fuse match which application, if you're using a fuse. And then a couple of device, so that's a couple of different type of fuses that you can use there. Then there, we have a switch device. A switch device can close. Now that's that's different than a fuse. You can close, you can open, or you can do both. Um, one or more electrical circuit. Now you're getting into a switch that could either um, you can open and close it. Control. You're doing more control with these devices, not just interrupting a current. You're controlling the flow of the current, closing and opening contact. Sectionalizers is sim similar to this, where you can shift one feeder from one load from one feet to another so that's you getting into the control with with the devices any comments guys anybody can jump please at any time jump in with your ideas um so these are another switching devices and of course the most important thing the cheapest that you can put in a medium motor switch gear for the most part is a fuse fuse disconnect now let me get into the circuit breakers circuit breakers advantage you can close you know, with the fuse, you need a fuse and a disconnect so you can control all the enclosing. And for a circuit breaker, a circuit breaker can get you multiple, and we all know, like, like we import, like even low voltage circuit breakers. Um, air circuit breakers, low voltage, they can get you the ability to turn off load, no problem. You have a, a 100 amp that's going to the city of Wara, and I want to turn off that transmission, that distribution line. I can turn off that 100 amp at 30 minutes. And you can turn off short circuit of ground fault, that's another. Big advantage for the circuit breaker, and of course you can open and close the circuit breaker, so you can control, give you some type of control over your system. 
Um, so that's it. So they call it here. They, they, and we're, this is no difference than this is no difference than if you were familiar with 6,000 amp or I mean 4,000 amp low voltage switch here with um, um, with electronic circuit breakers, drought circuit breakers. That's exactly similar in the high voltage. Any comments? Any questions? Comments? Then cutouts, guys, the fuses and circuit breakers, uh, a disconnect with the fuse, um, with the link, and then we have divisive groups, uh, disconnects. To, so most of the, you know, either in the high voltage, guys, either they use the fuse sometimes as a disconnect, or you have to assign a disconnect with the fuse. So especially the utilities like the, fu the fuse them as a disconnect. Um, so disconnect, they define it. You have to isolate the circuit. You have, you know, the, the disconnect is supposed to be you interrupt. Some of the disconnect, most of the disconnect, guys, they're not load interrupters. You have, if you have a disconnect, they have to be ready for load interrupters. Unlike the low voltage, and I hate to say that, if you have a, a 50, 50 horsepower, 600 volt rated disconnect switch, you're not supposed to open it under load, right? You're supposed to be energetic or not open it. But if you open it, it's not going to blow up in your case because it's if you write it, you rate it right, right? That's what you rate it by horsepower and amps, most of these. In the high voltage, you're going to be very careful opening anything unless that's my first thing that, that, that hit me is the importance of interrupting a load is a big deal in the high voltage. Anything. Interrupting voltage, not short circuit, load. You have 100 amp. You would think, there's a switch. I can just flip that switch here and open 100 amp. You're going to see if it's not rated as a load interrupter. You're going to be looking for a word load interrupters. Are they load interrupters? Yes. Then take the switch down. If they're not load interrupter, you're going to see an eight foot arc coming out of that, that uh, switch and burning some equipments. So pay a lot of attention to disconnect in terms of are they old load interrupters or not. Um, interrupter switch, um, switch capable of making, carrying, and interrupting a specified current, either as a load or as a short circuit. Okay, then they, they go into the oil cutouts, guys. This is the way they extinguish the arc inside the oil. Um, oil switches, the same thing. And regular, and, and regular bypass. Um, Combination of devices designed to bypass a regulator, voltage regulator. And that's it. That's all the definition that we have of that about the high voltage. If you guys go to the low voltage, I don't know how many of you have counted how many definitions. So if you're looking at direction of the device, good luck. Over under 3.3, .3, good luck. Um, so not a whole lot in the NEC cookbook. Any comments, guys, about the definition? And I flew through them. Um, any questions? Any comments? Gosh, I thought you guys were going to put me on the spot. Bunch of engineers here, all this good stuff. Okay, um, I'm going to go directly into the second part, guys. The NEC code book is, is, is concerned mostly about safety. So what's better than working around electric, uh, electrical equipment, medium voltage? I use the word medium voltage, but the code considered high voltage. Medium voltage equipment energized. It's like if you have a switch gear, a, a 4,000 amp switch gear or switch board, um, and you're going to work around it. You have to have the clearances. So there's a few things about the clearances I threw over here. Um, so you have to have accessibility to the equipment and work space and some guarding. Some guarding. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the, the, the tunnels. There's some information about tunnels over 600 volt. Um, so if you guys go to Article 110, Article 110, the first section general, and I'm not going to go over all these, the first section um, is general, but it applies to the medium voltage. For example, approval. Conductors, equipment shall be acceptable only if approved. Does that apply to the medium voltage? Of course it applies, but you wouldn't find it under the medium voltage. You find it under section I, section one. Um, so I just listed all these things that's coming from a section that, just to, to be aware that these are actually also of light high voltage. Approval of equipment, examination, everything has to be examined. Uh, the voltages, uh, things have to be rated for the right voltage to be connected to the right equipments. Um, uh, coordination between, we, we, I showed you guys a couple of things about short circuit that we do. So you have to have the circuit impedance, the short circuit current rating, um, and other characteristics when you design the whole system. These are typical for the low voltage as well as for the high voltage, so no difference. No difference. 
Um, but I just listed them quick here, just to emphasize that you have to pay attention. Deteriorating agents, you can't put a switch gear in a place, a need to a switch gear in a place, that's good. you're not gonna find the metal in the switch gear because it's highly corrosive. So pay attention to the same thing. Mechanical execution of work, because does that ring for the low voltage guys, does that ring a bell? You have to work things, do things in a workmanlike manner. That also applies to the high voltage. So um, mounting and cooling, you have to mount the equipment in a way that it can cool itself, either, either force cool or natural cool. Electrical connections, I'll talk about electrical connection guys because that's a major difference. Uh, later on we'll talk about um, termination. Can I terminate in the low voltage based on 90 degree as of now? Can I sign the conductor based on 90 degree to carry the current, not for duration? To carry, that you have a PSX conductor rated for 90 degree, right? Can I size the amp to carry at 90 degree? Not duration, just conductor. No, we would use the 90 degree for duration, right? And the max rating size is 75. 75. No, yes. Did you guys do that? I always give that. Did you have, have you done that and approved? Well, they do make the ones. Yeah. They make the ones. Yeah. But have you done it in the low voltage though? Yeah. It's, it's, it always gets on the power. It's process. And you're up to right. If you go to a 14 electrical connection, it will tell you unlisted equipment is listed otherwise. It's always a business system. <coughs> the common practice has always been uh, the for the, the the 75 is what you, what you, and I get this one all the time when I train guys, is what we, the lugs are there for the high medium voltage. Why, why, why can't we put them in that low voltage and size based on, my understanding, there's a whole lot of discussion is, right now is not allowed at least, but I don't, but the word is there to say that you can do it. Okay, arc flash, does arc flash a big deal in the high medium voltage? Of course, so it allows it the same thing. Uh, identification of conductors means you have to identify them. Uh, current transformers, if you have a current transformers, guys, we all learned probably this applies a lot for the medium voltage and low voltage. You don't shorten, you get into a high voltage, risky high voltage, right? That's why they come with that little deal that you short them so you can minimize the high voltage part. Um, this is, I grew, I grew this one, guys, um, just because it applies to the low voltage as a high voltage. In 2011, you, you want you to label the service and other than dwelling, you have to label it with the available short circuit, right? That applies to the high voltage and the low voltage, the maximum available fault current. So who cares? You have to go do the short circuit calculation that I showed you before, all these calculations. Um, so you have to have the date of the fault calculation um, and sufficient durability, and also it has to be uh, durable for the location, that marking, so you don't write it in a pencil so it's not going to be there so you have to this is applied to the high voltage as well as a low voltage and i can't emphasize the word service so if you have this has been typical guys at least in the engineering project that we worked on in the hospital when you have a pen 277 say 48277 minus 225 what do you do when you label it with the available short the width stand rating the interrupting rating of the circuit breaker as well as the uh, and rating of the circuit breaker as well as you are the available short circuit right in at that pen. So this is not new if you're working on an engineer projects. What they did in the 2011, they make it enforceable. This is also new. Um, if you do any substantial modification in the medium voltage or low voltage, you have to recalculate good news for the engineers because that's generate business, right? For us, they have to come back to us and we have to recalculate the short circuit and relabel in the field. Um, so recalculate, relabel. Um, this is uh, good news for the medium voltage, most likely. If you have a medium voltage switch gear, you're manufacturing guys. Um, labeling field marking requirements shall not be required to industrial um, installation. That's most likely they might have a medium voltage in that one. Where smart people like yourself doing the maintenance and the supervision and all the stuff. So you don't have to mark. You would think it's an exception. Again, industrial. The marking is not is an exception. Any comments, guys, about this? So I threw that one because it was changed in 2011, and it applies to both uh, uh, medium voltage as, as as well as a low voltage. Um, okay, 
so then then the code guys in in uh, in section 30 start talking about enclosures enclosure accessible to qualified people like you only qualified people like you have you can put them in a vault room closet surrounded by wall fences and so forth um and the, they talk about the design of the enclosure shall be designed and constructed to the nature and the degree of the hazard so to protect you from the nature degree of the hazard outdoor installation you have to have wallet in or fence it if you put uh, if you put your your medium voltage equipment there they have a dim some uh, dimension for the fence that you can do over here with barbed wire and minimum distance from the fence as a switch yard are you guys familiar with the switch yard they're talking about this is almost a switch yard you can design your switch yard that, like they call it so that's a distance from um so let's just say this is nominal voltage which is line to line this is my um, 13 8 here and we are using feet so it's a 15 feet minimum distance to the light parts um, from the fence to light parts anybody have used guys this table these are if you're doing a, a, a fence and a switch yard medium voltage to build your fence around it, that will help you with some dimensions as you draw your switch yard. This is nominal voltage. Nominal voltage line to line. On this is a line to new, it's line to brown, it's line to line. Usually these tables, very good point is, go to the tables, if they want you to go line to, to brown, they'll say line to, to brown. These are line to line. Nominal voltage line to line. And um, remember that little uh, NEC code book that we were just, uh, the National Electric Safety Book? These are coming directly from the National Electric Safety Code Book. Any comments, guys? Okay, so that my fence. Electrical volts, they go through a detailed putting equipment in a vault. Later on, I hope we can reach. If not, I can e forward it to you. Which equipment need a vault and which equipment does not need a vault? If your equipment need a vault, um, then this is how we design the vault at this point. There's a place where later on, I don't know if I can reach it, but I will again email it to you guys which equipment needed, which does not need. So they talk about the roof and the wall, obviously substantial structurally have to be sound so you can put your equipment on it. It's all about how long you can, the fire can sit there. So here's your three hour rating for, for the wall. And and oh, by the way, if you're thinking we're gonna be doing uh, studs and uh, wall boards, this is not your baby, if you guys can see that. So you're looking at concrete type vaults so you can put your equipment in. Uh, floor, the same thing. Uh, electrical, me, these are medium voltage electrical equipment. You're talking about four inch, equivalent, almost equivalent to three hour rated. Um, okay, and, and of course, it ha if, it's, if it's sitting at another structure that it has to be able to handle the fire in the other structure too. Doors, um, if you have an interior door, that opens to the vault it has the door itself i don't know how many you have a vault and you open to the inside of the building you have to have a three hour rated door three hour rated door so you can see guys it's uh, it's all about now we're in a vault we have medium voltage equipment that require a vault and how do you build this vault for your medium voltage equipment um this is for interior walls if you guys read that one too the authority having jurisdiction can also require it for the exterior walls as well the three hour rated wall. Like everything else in the NEC code book, guys, there's an exception. If you have some type of a sprinkler system with these requirements, you can lower it down to one hour. Any comments, any questions about the vault? The vault? Okay, locks, it makes sense. If you have a vault, you're gonna lock it and uh, keep it locked. So you have to have a lock, you have to keep it locked. Only people like yourself can, um, can enter it and it has the door have to because of arc flash and big ball of fire chasing you you have to have a panic uh, bars and the door have to swing out this is typical guys if you have a transformer inside the vault now if you have a switch gears one thing you have a transformer oil transformer then it it, it refers you to the article 450 and then you have to have venting and you have containment and, and a bunch of other things. And they have it at the end of the, the presentation. 
Okay, um, indoor installation accessible to unqualified people. If you if you have an equipment accessible to unqualified people, obviously you have to um, you have it has to have metal enclosed equipment, um, switch gears. So it talks about the equipment. So basically, completely, um, this is my favorite opening. Look at that. All the foreign objects inserted through these openings are deflected from the energized parts. That's typical also for the low voltage guys. You don't want people to be sticking, if it's open to the public outdoor, people sticking things into it and getting into the high voltage section. Um, access to qualified people. Now we are inside a switch gear, um, uh, a bolt or a, a switch gear room, guys. Um, if it's accessible to uh, qualified people like yourself, then our only concern here is with the clearances. Our only concern is with the clearances working around the equipment. These are accessible only to you, qualified people. So you can put this type of equipment. Um, accessible to unqualified people, then um, and outdoor installation, then you get into fencing and, 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 and all this good stuff too in that area. Um, if you now we're we're moving to the outdoor again, accessible to qualified people like us, then the same the concern always is how you're going to work around the equipment and the, the rating of the equipment. You can see if it's accessible to non qualified people, you have to guard it, you have fence it and elevate it. Uh, unqualified people, you do the same thing, but you also have to pay attention to the working, um, working clearances. And there's a couple of equipments here that, that goes with it. Um, okay, um, if you have enclosed equipment accessible to unqualified people, the same thing I highlighted that it has to be deflected from the energized part, um, suitably guarded, exposed to, this is where the tamper proof equipment, if. You guys have seen it also in the low voltage, uh, low voltage part. If this is accessible, um, enclosed equipment accessible to unqualified people, so you're putting a switch gear back in the backyard with people right next to the parking lot. So you have it has to be uh, completely enclosed for tampering and so forth. Unless you're elevating it eight feet, and shall be kept. And if it's uh, if it's below eight feet. Uh, less than eight feet, you have to have a lock and it has to be locked at all times. Typical for low voltage too, if you have a transformer, you see this all the time. Um, so we have enclosed equipment accessible to unqualified people, the same thing, doors and covers. Um, there's a couple of things guys, um, the bolts, the same, the protection, so people don't tamper with them. If it's underground, then you have to pay attention to troublemakers so they can they can open that vault and get to it with a weight. So so there's a weight requirement if you have a switch gear. And that's just, there's also similar to the low voltage has very similar requirement like this too. Okay, and then the couple of things guys moving on is um, work around electrical equipment. You're familiar with working around electrical equipment. So if you are to work around electrical equipment energized, you have to give access. Um, so ready, safe operation for the electrical equipment. That's the most important things if you are to maintain electrical equipment energized. So um, energized parts, you they, they get you into the width and the height of the, the door, the clearances base that you have to enter to. You have a door or something, you give you a height and the you can see the height and the width of that door. The depth, so you got in there, but you need to also have enough room to work on. We'll, we'll look at the table in a second and make sure the typical for all low voltage, if you have a, a door for the low voltage, you have to open at least 90 degree, at least. Any comments, guys? These are very similar to the low voltage for the most part, clearances. Um, entrances, at least one entrance to the vault or to the electrical room that you have. And for... Uh, those of us who are a little bit heavy, they give us 24 inches to get in and out, minimum. And the height, short people don't have any problem with six and a half. But if you are taller than that, you gotta pay attention to the, to the door. Um, large equipment, you guys are familiar with the large equipment. The NEC code book in the low voltage, define large equipment, different than in a high voltage as you're gonna see. So I'll, I have a picture for you. So it's switch gear, 
panels exceeding six feet in width. Um, this is one entrance at the end, at each end of the equipment. This is different than the low voltage. Um, in the high voltage, guys, the amp is not a, a big deal because you can have a 100 amp piece switch gear that carries uh, at 13.8, that carries as much power as a 4,000 amp at 480. I didn't do the math on that, but you can, the amp, amp is not a big deal in the low voltage. You can have a six amps going into a building that take, uh, uh, or say uh, 20 amps going to a building that's taking maybe say 1,200 amp uh, service. So amp is not a big deal. That's why they don't, the only concerned about the exceed six feet piece of equipment, exceed six feet in a room, then you have to have two doors, two entrances to that room. Uh, there's an exception for this, <clears throat> and here's um here's a couple of these are guys. I just modified them from the low voltage part. So you need an entrance for the electrical room. You guys are very familiar with it, typical like high voltage, low voltage, no difference in this one. Um, if your equipment have a real real access, you have to give it also real access to your equipment. Um, here's where it's, it becomes different than the electrical room. Uh, then low voltage. If you have a switch gear, the only requirement for uh, two entrances is only over 600, 600 volt. Um, and the low voltage, 1200 amps. It has it's tied also with 1200 amps. If I remember right, 1200 amps and six over 1200 amps and six uh, over six uh, six feet. So if you have a piece of equipment over six uh, feet in length then you are required by code to have these two doors at both at, at each end of the, the piece of equipment. Any comments, guys? Any comments about this? So there's also like uh, anything else in any secret book, there's an exception. Like, like anything else in any secret book, guys, there's an exception. The exception for this one is they call it continuous unobstructed way of exit. So um, you're standing here in front of us. This is typical also for the low voltage. You are standing right here and there's a working on this equipment energized with the proper PPE and there's a big ball of fire chasing you. You only have one way. If you're right in here and, um, and there is no door here, this is closed. You can, it's about trapping. You don't want to be trapped with a big ball of fire coming. And the ball came here in this area. Now you are trapped and so Typical, very typical. If you're familiar with the low voltage, that's exactly what we do with the low voltage. The only difference is there is no amp um, requirement. It's only link. Unobstructed. So the reason I always say being an engineer, guys, design engineer, I always say people think, why, why can't we get this? You know, because this might be, if you're in downtown Minneapolis, that might be Hennepin here. And to get another entrance right here, it will, the architects will yell at you. Um, and, uh, you know, you have to have an arm and leg to, to fight for another, another interest on the other end. So that's why becoming doubling the distances or having the obstruction straight like this, another optional alternative for you, another optional alternative. The second option that I don't have it here, guys, is you double the clearances. So if the clearances give you five feet, double it, two, that will give you 10 feet, you're okay with, um, then you're okay with one interest. You're okay with one interest. Any comments, guys, about the un, um, unobstructed and twice? If you have an extra working space, you can have twice the distance allowed by this table, and then you, you can uh, get away with one entrance. Get away with one entrance. Any comments, any questions about that? Okay, so let me. Uh, yeah, the uh, voltage is coming. <laughs> The voltage that, yep, yeah, the, the voltage, I have a table in a second for you. Uh, let me go, as a matter of fact, directly to the cable here. Here you go. So this this is the table. I don't know if you got enough of me. This is, looks exactly the same like the low voltage table, right? The same three conditions. If I am a, um, if I'm a 600 amp 38 switch gear in front of me, um, another 1600 amp switch gear, that will be condition three. Condition two, on the switch gear in front of me is a, a, a concrete wall. That's condition two. I'm a switch gear in front of me as, I don't know how you're going to find it here, a wood or non grounded object. Um, so that would be condition one. I don't know how you're going to find condition one. It could be in a, in a medium voltage. So um, 
you talk somebody talked you talked about the voltage to ground um here's how the the nominal voltage when they want it want it to ground they add two ground so that's where the nominal voltage to ground so if i'm uh, looking at um, 13.8 what's line to ground 13.8 92 how much 8200 so we're here so if you get uh, 138800 to ground if you're condition 1 4 condition 2 and condition 3 any comments guys about these conditions very typical exactly like the low voltage except the distances are a little bit higher distances are a little bit higher any comments and the voltage is always to ground in these the voltage is to ground and they define what the conditions are three is two phases facing each other and um, when we talked about this one, guys, um, if you are putting, if your equipment is over 600 feet and you don't want to, um, what, you, what you're going to do is you're going to double the distance, right? So imagine that telling the architects that now I need a clearance in the front switch, my switch gear 10 feet just to get away with one, uh, with one um, entrance. Any comments about this, that, that table? This is really it, the table in terms of clearances. From the NDC code book. Um, okay, guarding. Okay, so anything, guys. If you have anything bare, energized, you have to guard it. Makes makes sense. Um, parts at any voltages or insulated um, parts above 600 volt. You have to do guarding for these uh, voltages. If you have personnel doors into the electrical equipment. Then they make sense. It's going to be an egress, right? And also, there has to be pa um, panic doors so you can uh, you throw yourself at the door and the door will open within 25 less less than 25 feet from the door. So you have to have one door less than 25 feet and um, shall open in the direction of egress. And it has this uh, pressure plate or panic bars. Typical on these. Oh. Uh, personnel doors less than 25 feet from working space. Any personnel doors within 25 feet, you have to have this requirement. Okay, um, yes, I have to go to the language. Yeah, within 25 feet, 25 feet or less, it has to open. In, in the egress direction. Okay, access electrical equipments on the platform, balconies, blah, blah. They have, if you put, ele if, with the medium voltage guys, we elevate them in mezzanine, so you have to have some means, a permanent means of getting to them, some permanent means of getting to these equipments if you elevate them. Any equipment that need examination, like we just, um, why this is really how to define I don't know if you guys get into how do you define and again being an engineer if you have to err we always as engineers errs on the side of safety so if you if this switch gear really that do I need to work on the back of that switch gear energize or not if you're in doubt and size it, especially in the medium voltage size it as if you're going to work on the energize and get your clearance so uh, here's how they define it I always find it interesting equipment requires examination or adjustment, um, or servicing, or maintenance while energized. That's the term that the, the interesting term. While energized, then require this clearances in the front of it, or in the back of it, in the front of it, or in the back of the equipment. If the equipment requires adjustment, servicing, or maintenance in the front or the back. If you have a switchboard that's thrown against the wall anyway, low voltage switch gears. If the, if you require to work on anything energized in the back. Then you you have to have the clearances in front of the back, front and the back. Um, and how they measure these distances, either from the front of the switch gear or from the live parts. If you have a switch yard and the switch yard is all live wires all over, you're going to measure it from the live parts. You have a switch gear design, and then from the panels, and that's where these measurements are coming from. Any comments, guys? The clearances. So this is where 
a couple of, uh, here's a two switch gears. Uh, here's your 4160 and 13.8. And if you want to find A, and, and, and these are, oh, by the way, um, these are less than six feet because otherwise we're going to double the distance. Six feet or less. Suppose that they're six feet or less. And you need to find all these distances in the front of the switch gears. So if you, does that make sense? Example of, I have two switch gears face, facing each other. One of them 13.8, the other one is 4160. And you need to find the clearances in front of it. You, if you guys work with architects, that's the first thing they ask us about. What's the size of your, of your electrical room or your vault or so forth? So from here, if, if you guys go to the table, A is going to be between uh, condition number three, right? Because the equipment is six feet or less. Otherwise, we have to double that distance. Um, so that's for A. Anybody disagree with that in terms of going all the way back to... Um, to basically this, uh, and, and by the way, if you have two voltages, which voltage do you go to? You go to the highest voltage, right? So that's a condition exactly that nine, uh, the uh, thirteen eight will lie in the second row. That will give me six feet, right? So the second condition, guys. So that's A. Um, so my six feet. <clears throat> the second one is B. Um, a switch gear require um, rear access. If your switch gear require rear access. And medium voltage switch gear require rear access on energized equipment, then we require rear access while energized. Then you have to treat this is concrete here, and you're going to treat it as condition number two, and that will get you five feet. Um, the interrupter switch require front access only while energized, front access only while energized, this area here. And if it's front access only while energized, so if you, you work on the energized in the back, in the back, then you see a code book say, guys, you only need just 30 inches to allow you to maneuver. You're working on things they energize in the back of that switch gear. Any comments, guys, about the clearances? Yes, sir. As it's you're going to work on the energize. Well, yes, or you can prove that it's the energize. Yeah. 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 Y
where, where the example is not over six feet. I see. So you're not going to fight anything listed. Um, how about yeah, for the sake of the example, yes. <laughs> but but you're right. If you have two more, one more section that you're above the six feet, then you have to add. Uh, yeah. Then then um, then it's easy. You're going to double this distance. <laughs> easy for me. Then you're going to multiply this by two. Now you're talking about twelve. Now you go to the architects and you get your fights with the architects over 12 feet. <laughs> For those of us who work with architects, you... Yeah, yeah. Most of... <laughs> if you have medium voltage, usually the medium voltage distribution system, they usually listen to you. Good. Oh, so would you measure from the handle? From the front, the right here, from the the handle of the switch, the switch gear. You're right. You have to have clear. <laughs> Did you guess? Were you serious? Did they go that that picture? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The gear, not the wall. <laughs> the gear, not the wall. Okay. Uh, the last one, guys. If your equipment and it seems there's a kind of a an agreement here that might not even exist here because of in the media voltage, but it's still there in the code. If you have to work on it dead, you should write them. You really, you guys write them and say maybe you should get rid of this and treat it as if you have access in the back, treat it as hot, and you know because that's. Yeah. But physically, can see that that knife switches are open. Or you can draw the, the circuit breaker out and it's completely outside. Yeah, if you open it first, then it's hot. Yeah. Okay. Um, so high volt separation. There's a couple of things, guys, it talks if you have a, this is typical if you have a switch gear, if you have a, um, a substation, high voltage section, um, and low voltage section, and transformer in between, you have to separate the high voltage section from the low voltage section. Um, so separation from low voltage equipment by suitable partition and fence or, or screen. Like everything else, there's an exception. If you have a... Um, the equipment, low voltage equipment in the switch gear room or the vault, like lights, switches, receptacles, they have to be there. Um, so you have uh, equipment operating switches or others that operate to feed the electrical room or the vault. They have to be there with that switches. This is a 480 switch. Okay. Um, Locked rooms and enclosure, guys, exposed part um, have to be locked. Over 600 shall be kept locked. And you have to have um, a sign right at the room where you have your equipment. We're all familiar with that high voltage. Um, stay away. And under, under uh, observation, qualified person at all times, then you can unlock it. That's an, an exception. Uh, nobody gets in there under at all times people are there, then you, you don't have to lock it. A uh, couple of uh, illumination, guys. This is really interesting. You have to have illumination to be able to see the equipment. Typical for high voltage, low voltage. In the low voltage, I don't know if you guys noticed in 2011, they see that light that you're looking at. And this is, I'm not, this light right here cannot, if it's a low voltage switch gear, um, it cannot be controlled by auto means only. In the high voltage, they, somebody forgot to put it there. So right now, 
I can put an occupancy sensor uh, or motion detector on a, on a, in an inside to control the light inside a switch gear, medium volt switch gear. And there's nothing that says in the code that can't. Um, if you have lighting outlets, obviously you're going to arrange it in a way that does not endanger the people as they change the ballast, especially in the old time open switch gears guys you walk into an area you put the lights you might be if you move your hand the wrong way you're touching copper the old switch gear design i don't know how these days i don't know if anybody install even things like that in with open switch gear point of uh, control shall be located uh no like to come contact with light parts okay we'll get into um, elevation of um, unguarded lights. So we have uh, you, you elevate things. Um, again, we're talking about light parts now. Nothing insulated, guys. Like a switch yard. That's basically switch yard. So here's the elevation based on the voltage. And again, now nominal uh, nominal voltage between phases. Nominal voltage between phases. So we are looking at 13.8 here and you're elevating light parts at this distance or higher at this is minimum distance or minimum um, height that you can elevate the equipment if it's light okay so here's my equipment if it's light based on the height and like a switch yard this is we're talking about switch yard um 13.8 coming from the top to that switch yard Now, Randy, that you said, I don't know if this will be from that point here. That's the light part, huh? Have you made me, right? Is that where the light part is? Okay. This is typical, guys, if you have a sprinkler system or any duct or anything shall not be located in the vicinity. Typical for low voltage, high voltage. Uh, condensation. Um, you have a condensation, you have to protect them from leakage, pipe going all the way into that area, for an object leaking right above your switch gear. Uh, pipe not be concerned. If it's uh, if it's sprinkler system into the room, it, it's not concerned foreign. Other than that, every other object that has nothing to do with the room is considered foreign, and you have to protect from leakage if you are to put the pipe right above the, not right above, high above the switch gear. Okay, so that's for the clearances. Then the second thing guys talks about the um, raceways and cables, um, uh, conductors. You can use an MC medium, MC, you can use a cable, um, um, MV cable, or you can use uh, bare conductors. Um, there's a couple of things guys provided in, in these article about each one of these systems. Um, if you have live parts, especially the live parts, and you put the light parts next to each other, you have to pay attention to the clearances between light parts on insulators when you put them on insulators. Um, and if you have insulators, which you should, um, it has to be able to withstand the maximum magnetic force from a short circuit. Typical, the maximum magnetic force, uh, force from, um, from a short circuit. We have to support them to protect from physical damage. Your, your um, um, equipment and insulated wires and cables and so forth. Um, and this is where uh, where I, it, it becomes interesting. We talked guys about sizing based on, this is a major change. When we size in the low voltage, we said the highest that we can go is 75 based on the conductor determination. In the medium voltage, the default is 90. Now you can, if your lugs are rated, if your cable is rated 105 and your lugs are rated for 105, then you can size based on 105. Do you guys, anybody size 105 lugs? The default is exactly like, your default is 90, 90 amp MV cable, but you can use, why would you use 105 then? The rating. The only thing they use 105 is the rating. So, um, this is a major difference in terms of sizing a conductor. These tables, um, I'm sure if you guys are in the medium voltage, then um, I want to emphasize the word here, otherwise identified. That's exactly where with the low voltage, unless otherwise identified. Um, but your default is 90. So nobody sizes based on one, 105. Can I get anybody? You guys size 105? Okay. 
So if your logs were engineers, we can size anything as long as you put your name on it. But if it's identified, if you have a cable and if the cable is identified 105, the logs are 105, there's nothing says you can't size this 105. Get your smaller conductor, cheaper installation. Um, okay, you guys are familiar with these tables, I'm sure. This is, um, um, if you are in the low voltage, you, you're 310, this is, these are equivalent to 310.15B16. This is where you start. The whole thing starts right here. I just want to emphasize, I have a couple of them. If you have, uh, this is obviously find the amps of an insulated single copper conductors, uh, triplexed in the air, triplexed in the air, um, on the conduct, oh, based on the temperature of 90 um, and 105 conductors and ambient temperature of 40. The most important things when you guys go to the medium voltage is read the top of the table. We in the low voltage, I don't know how many of you guys use, I dare to say that if you're doing 600 volt or less, you probably spend 90% of your time in 310.15 B16 for the most part, right? 10%, maybe you do 17, 18, 19 if you do cable trays and so forth. In the high voltage, you have to spend a lot of time in saying how are we, what type of cables, how am I going to bring the medium voltage into my building? And if you're bringing it to this, I don't know, this will be used later on. Some of you will say, why would you put a, um, a triplex on in the air and pull it in the air medium voltage between two locations? Later on, they use this table also for cable trays. If you put in cable trays with the rating. So they use them also for cable trays, typical. If you put in cable trays, now we're talking. Um, so this is very typical, guys. If my voltage, I like to go all the way to... Um, See, my voltage here is 13.8. I'm in this area, and I decided to use what Lisa said, 105, and um, and I I can I'm going to pull a one one out. So give me 255, 255. Any comments about using this one based on the voltage? I decided to put a log 105. Um, 105 log, and I pulled. Um, <laughs> um, if there's a log, I didn't install it. Lisa, you guys, you say you you do them 105. Yeah. If you have a log that's rated, I didn't install it. If you have a log that's rated for 105, and the cable cables are there, there are cables 105. Then you size. If I don't know as an engineer, unless I know and I've done the project, guys, you default, you're absolutely right. My default is right in here um, into the 90. That's my default. So you're basically, there's a jump in the end, right? There's what, 30 amp jump between the two? When it comes to the high voltage, guys, the when it comes to the high voltage, the amps is not really your concern. The amps have never been your, a big concern, the amps. You can see how we size the conductors. The short circuit is your concern. Your amp, anyway, you might have to go from one out into four out to protect based on the sitting of your relay, just to protect your relay from short circuit. Yeah, Uh, I heard about you are listening, but I really, that's why the, the low voltage, you're talking about low voltage now. Right, and I think the same thing might apply to this stuff. To this, yeah. But if you're, um, I think probably, Lisa, you guys you do utility work, and utilities do a lot of stuff kind of slightly different than that. Right. So um, that's probably where the 105 came to be. If you are to do this switch gear in a building, probably you're sticking with uh, with 90. Randy, what do you think? Okay. Yes, sir. Yep. I know. 
what I want to refer you guys to is um, if you look at in 2011, I don't know how many of you have paid attention to this. We have a, a derating table. This this amp is based on 40 degrees Celsius. That's hot. If you go higher or lower than that, then you have to derate. That's the first time, to my knowledge, that we have derating for medium voltage. We have a new table now. We derate based on temperature for medium voltage. That's brand new in 2011. Um, before that, we have to go to a different documents. Okay, so that's basically one of them, guys. Um, branch circuit sizing, we'll talk about this one when you size a branch circuit um, later on. I have an example quick here. Um, isolating for oil switches. Um, okay, building structure location. So this talks about, guys, if you have conductors outdoor, and I, because of the time, I'm just gonna jump a quick here. Um, so we have, if you have 225 talks about if you're taking a medium voltage between, in a campus between point A and point B, where are you gonna put them? Location of, of, of the switch, the disconnects and so forth. Uh, be electrically operated by, uh, or, re, um, or located remotely and controlled remotely. Uh, disconnect, uh, like all disconnects, they have to disconnect all the hot conductors and the neutral, but they have to be, neutral is not an issue in here. But if you connect, disconnect the neutral, you have to tie them all together, right? Um, and they have a false. Look at this one. They have fault closing rating not less than the maximum available short circuit. Uh, fault closing rating. They don't want you. The challenge is you throw these switches, and they want. What if you close on a on a fault? So they want you to have a fault closing, not interrupting. But if you were to close it in a fault. Um, it has to be able to, everybody knows what the rule is. What, what do you do if you close in a fault? Do you open it, the switch? No, you don't open it. If you know and you close in a fault, then they always tell you, you throw these switches, and if there's a fault, let the circuit breaker or the fuse take care of it. Don't reopen that switch, because you create more, more damage if you try to reopen that switch than closing it. Um, okay. Fuse cutouts. Uh, if you have fuse cutouts, uh, ungrounded means to disconnect them. Permanent legible signs right next to the fuse cutouts that you don't open them under load for the fuse. Um, uh, being locked to the, you can uh, disconnect means shall be be locked in the open position, and the locking device have to be in place shall be remain in place. Typical. Didn't they have brought this one to the high low voltage lately for motors? Same thing. You can't have these portable locks for these equipments. They allow you guys fuse cutouts if you can put them in a cabinet and lock the cabinet and whatever you can you can use it as a lockout. A couple of things and I'm going to move right through it. This is all guys almost typical from the low voltage. The position, the identification. If 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 your switch is up, your switch is up. It's on. And it has to be marked on, off, up is on, identification. Every time you have a medium voltage cable, you have to identify where that disconnect is, is feeding or, or and so forth, identification of all your disconnects. Um, this is, they added these in 2011, guys, a lot of inspection and testing. Um, so here's inspection, pre-energization and operating tests that you have to do. Um, protective relays, switching, so forth, and at the end, you have to get it to the approval of the authority having jurisdiction. Inspect your disconnect. Um, complete electric, the complete electrical system shall be perform shall be performance tested when first installed on the site. So that's a lot of testing for the medium voltage commissioning of the system, and you have to do it through the approval of the authority having jurisdiction. Uh, Pre-energization testing, guys. They list a couple of things that you have to do: instrumental transformers, um, protective relays, the voltage, the current, the interrupting, and so forth. Uh, switching circuits, control signals, metering. All these have to be tested pre-energization. Um, acceptance test. So that's so acceptance test. Um, and all your tests at the end, you have to send your test to the authority uh, having jurisdiction. So this is typical in the medium voltage, a lot of tests that you have to do on all these equipments for relays and so forth, a utility phase uh, difference and so forth, and provide that test 
pre-energization operation test to the authority having jurisdiction. And then I picked a couple of things, things, guys, for clearances. Now remember, we are the U of M. We're taking a 13-8 feeder from one building to another overhead. That's what we're talking about here. So if you're taking these guys, then you have to have a clearances, clearances of roadways, uh, walkways, and so forth. This is a couple of clearances. These are all coming from the uh, National Electric Safety Code too. So you can look at these. Couple of clearances. Any comments, guys? Couple of clearances coming again from, um, these are clearances over the buildings or the structures, how far you can go. And if, you know, and my favorite is if you go, this is 22 kVA uh, or less. If you go over 22 kVA, now you're getting higher voltage, then you have to start increase 0.4 of an inch for every one kW. Every one kW above 22, you increase that, that table by 0.4 of an inch. Warning, if you guys, uh, substation. In 2011, they added this to this article. I know how many of you guys, that's in 2011, they added a substation. And they said, uh, warning, you have to have a permanent warning, typical. If you look at this, that's right at the, at the face of a substation, danger. You have to put this one um, at the entrance of the electrical equipment vaults or rooms. We talked about this one at the point where the uh, um, uh, at the point of access to the conductor, so people don't mess around with medium voltage cables. And also, if you are cable if you are cable traying it, if you're doing a cable tray, you have to put them every ten feet. That's 2011. 2011. Um, isolating equipment. Um, Isolating, uh, so this is where while carrying current, they don't want you guys to have isolating switch. You don't want to open the switch under load unless the load, the switch is rated for load interrupters. I always say with the medium voltage, don't miss any switch. Don't open things, especially switches, because it's easy to open a switch unless it's rated for um, for load interrupters. Uh, fuse locations, uh, warning operation not to replace. Look at this. I mean, who? not to replace fuses while the circuit is energized. While the circuit is energized. I know utilities replace them all the time on the poles. You know, you grab that little hot stick and you put them one at a time. And if you have a short circuit, it will take that fuse. Um, but in, you know, you, you in, a, in a substation, you de-energize the equipment and then you place your fuses. Backfeed with substation guys, it's especially if you have high voltage, it's highly unlikely you're going to have one feed coming to the building, multiple feeds. So you have to warn the people that the con you have a transfer switch. The contacts on both the load and the line side of that um, switch will be energized, right? Because you have two feeds coming from this side, coming from the other side. You have a disconnect to disconnect this feed. The line side of a disconnect will be de-energized if you open the disconnect, but if you're feeding the switch gear from the other side, then the load side of the disconnect will be hot from the other side. So you have to tell the people, be careful, just because the disconnect is open doesn't mean the load side is de-energized, right? Backfeed um, the system. Um, and this is really also a new permanent legible single line diagram. My fellow engineers will identify with this. Single line diagram of the station switching arrangement. I clearly identify each point of connection to the high voltage section uh, located within sight of each point connection. So you have to have a, a one line diagram right on the switch gear or next to the switch gear that shows all the ends and the outs and the feeds coming out of this medium voltage switch gear. If you have metal clad or, uh, or, or metal enclosed or metal clad, these are also added guys in 2011. Uh, permanent, legible, the same thing. You can have right on the switch gear. Um, you're going to have a one line diagram to identify the uh, interlocks, isolation means, all possible sources of voltages. If you have multiple voltages, uh, they have an exception for you. The next, this exception at the end, and I know I don't like to go to the exception because being an engineer, guys, we always, it's always nice to have a one line diagram on the face of a switch gear. I mean, no question asked. I would never argue with this one. But if you have a switch gear with only one cubicle that has a medium voltage and the rest of it medium voltage, transformer, low voltage, then you don't have to have a switch gear. That's an extent. You don't have to have a, light, uh, a, one, a one line diagram at the face of the switch gear or next to the switch gear. But I don't even like to, for engineers, I don't even like to mention that one. So 
Okay, permanent size. Um, the same thing for the switch gear, guys. You have to have the high voltage. Um, warning of danger of opening opening the the switches while energized. And some warning for the utilities. Okay, let's go to the service here quick. Um, for the service, guys, if you read if you article two. If you go to 230, there's so many requirements that applies to the high voltage um, that's coming from the low voltage tool. Um, take this. If you are using conductors, here's the minimum conductors, for example, that you can use for, for service conductors. Wiring methods that you can approve for high voltage. Um, isolating switches. If you have a switch, if you have a drought circuit breaker that can be disconnected, that's that's approved as a disconnect. If you have an oil switch, you have to have uh, a disconnect. The key point about the okay, service disconnect, you have to have two things in a service entrance disconnect. You have to be able to physically, mechanically isolate the utility, and you have to have some type of an over temperature device to interrupt the short circuit and the load. If you don't have this two in one device, then you have to have a disconnect. Um, so if you have like drought circuit breaker, you can draw that circuit breaker. Circuit breaker give you a lot of capabilities and upload and short circuit as well as isolation from, um, from the circuit. This is where probably where you just said the, uh, the intent is visible break in the circuit, but that's for the service. Physically, you can identify that you, like when you draw the circuit breaker to, I, Draw out circuit breaker, you physically can tell that it's isolated, you're disconnecting it from the circuit after you de energize it. Um, okay, uh, fuses, isolated switches, operated disconnect switches, accessible only to qualified people for switches only. And I'm going to run through it connecting to ground. This is where. Um, when you, we just talked about this guys, when you work on electrical equipment, you open the switches or the circuit breaker and you tie them, you have to tie them physically or, or by design, you tie phase A, phase B on the load side directly to the ground, ground the phases, ground the phases. So it means for readily connected, the load side, this is, this is mostly for high voltage. The load side conductors to the grounding electrode system, equipment, bus bar, blah, blah. So you are grounding your three phases. That's the only way you can, in a high voltage, that you can guarantee that they're not, the high voltage is not going to kill you. Nobody's energizing the lines. So you're going to bond them all together, right? If you're familiar with that one, A, B, you take A to B, B to C, C down to the ground, and then you verify now everything is dead. And you treat it as hot until you verify it. The utilities have their own. Here's the means that, so as you open this in a switch gear, it tie you directly phase A, phase B, phase C to the ground. Utilities use them, guys, you've seen that all the time when they go on, the, on their phases. They treat them all the way um, directly, you tie every phase to every phase, and then they take it to the grounded conductor, which is the neutral, which is also grounded grounded to the to the ground tied to the ground anybody have side these grounding you guys if we work on overhead conductors you size them they size them based on how much current um they can carry and how many cycles i don't know if you can see that this is weighted for 30 it can carry 30 uh, 43,000 amps for 15 cycles because it before it disintegrate and the worst thing that could happen to you is you leave this one and you energize a circuit. Now you have a dead bolted fault in your circuit, and it happened. Um, this group shall be permanently not readily accessible. Service disconnect shall shall be permitted to be not readily accessible. That's that's typical for that's not typical for low voltage guys. Usually disconnect for low voltage have to be really accessible. Um, you can have mechanical linkage. You go to so this one, it could be at the top of the pole and linkage mechanically here, or um, readily accessible at the point, or electronically. Um, you can open it. The disconnect could be somewhere else, and electronically, you can send the signal to disconnect, disconnect and opening it. Typical for, and we're talking about the disconnect for the service. Um, a couple of things, guys, about disconnect you have to 
clear all the un all the um, ungrounded conductor have to be open, uh, fault closing grating. Um, so you have to if it's closed if you're closing on a fault, it should be able to handle the fault at least doesn't disintegrate, not open the fault but handle the fault when you close in it. Um, and you can your disconnect plus your fuse could handle that fault closing grating. So if you have a disconnect that cannot hand, handle a fault closing on a fault, it could be tied to a fuse where if you are to close on a fault, your fuse will take care of it. Would take care of not your disconnect. Does that make sense? When you close in a fault, your fuse will open um, to, to protect you. Um, this one is really interesting. Multi buildings like a campus or so, you can have it could be located at a separate building, the disconnect, and electrically operated, not right at the building where it enters, uh, like the low voltage. And we're talking about the disconnect. And overcome protection device, we'll move in that one. This is um, the service, guys. This is really interesting. This is how we size, if you haven't done that, this is how they size the fuse and the circuit breaker for um, the service as well as for the branch circuit and the feeder. By the way, it's all the same. If you have a fuse, they size it three times, not to exceed three times the ambition of a conductor. So for all practical reasons, if I have a 100 amp, um, 100 amp cable, I can put um, a um, tripping point of a 300 amp fuse on it. 300 amp fuse, right? And if I have a circuit breaker, my circuit breaker for 100 amp can be 600 amp. Now with the relays, you can trip it lower when you do the coordination. You can coordinate your relays to trip it lower than that, but your actual physical size of your circuit breaker, um, that can be 600 amp on 100 amp fuse. Does that make sense? 600 amp circuit breaker on a, on a 100 amp cable or 300 amp fuse on a 100 amp um, cable. So these are, I thought these are different, uh, very different from what we size the low voltage. The low voltage, unless you have a, a transformer or a motor, your low voltage, the overcome protection device have to match the, have to match the conductor amp because you don't want it to burn. No, these. Six, yeah, this is not new. Ah, uh, now we're talking about low voltage. But, uh, this is to size. Yeah, this is sizing. This is. <laughs> this is the sizing. There are two different guys when it comes to circuit breaker, especially there are two sizes. There is the physical size of the circuit breaker, 600 amp, and then there is the sitting of the relay. The sitting of the relay, you decide it through your overcompression coordination. So the sitting of your relay could be set at 125 or 200 percent. Randy, is that what you were referring to, 125? So when the, there's, but fuse, you're stuck. The fuse, if you have a 300 amp fuse, you can't for the most part. You have 300 amp fuse, it's 300 amp fuse. So, but circuit breakers, yeah, you can have a 600 amp circuit breaker when, when you put your relay on an overcome takes 51, you can set your 51 to trip at 120. Um, any comments, guys? Any, the ones who do that? So that permission, um, take this. The restrictions, speaking of the, the restriction of the overcome protection device, 80% guys shall not apply. If you're familiar with the low voltage, we always say unless your circuit breaker, the low voltage, when they say low voltage, 600 volt or less, unless your circuit breaker is rated for 100% operation listed, you cannot pull more than 80% out of the circuit breaker. So this, your beautiful 100 amp circuit breaker is actually rated for 80. Uh, this does not apply to the uh, high voltage. Does not apply. So all of them are rated 100%, 100% operation. Sergio Resters, guys, they would like you to provide, uh, shall be permitted, permitted, look at the word, not required, shall be permitted on each ungrounded overhead service conductors. Typically with the medium voltage, guys, you put them on every time you go underground, you put them on every phase, right, to protect from lightning and surges and all this good stuff. Um, 
your service entrance equipment, high voltage, you have to go to Oracle. And I know that I have a lot of slides, guys. But I will email you this. If you go to 490, 490 gives you the clearances between phase A, phase B, and phase A, phase B, phase C, and the grounding conductor. I am not aware, and correct me guys if I'm wrong, in, in commercial industrial building, I'm not aware that we use the neutral. Do we use a neutral, the high voltage in neutral? Like would we use 7200 in, in a commercial industrial building? Anybody have wired things 7200 to ground? Typically, when you bring 13.8, you bring it to a transformer and you you dump it at 480 four and then you take it 480. Or you dump it 13.8 across the motor. Um, so utilities do it all the time, though. Utilities use 7200 to tie to single phase loads. So neutral becomes not a big deal in, in a commercial building. In the utilities, becomes a big deal, 7200. So you take one phase and the grounded conductor, a.k.a. the neutral. In the commercial industrial building, I'm not aware of anybody who runs 7200 to, on equipment. Um, this talks about the substantial amount of metal for your switch gear, guys, like you get into uh, UL here. Um, combustible floors, um, installed over combustible floors, it has to be suitable protection where to shall be provided if you put it on something have to be comb combustible and if you are to bring a switch gear that burning at 60, uh, say 69k 69k feeder coming to your switch gear then you are getting into um uh, you have to put it either in a metal enclosed terminated metal enclosed a switch gear or in a vault or in a vault metal enclosed switch gear or a vault Um, like everything else, guys, the overconfiguration device always at the point where you receive the power, right? If you, you receive the power in the switch gear, you put your fuse or circuit breaker at the point. There's some exception for, for, you know, for tabs and so forth, and I'm going to spare you a few of these. Um, this one, uh, really interesting, uh, conductor protection. So operating time of the protective device and the available short circuit and the conductor shall be coordinated. That's where you size the conductor. You're going to take the short circuit available, the, the clearing uh, time, as well as the damage curve for your conductor and coordinate all these. So yes, amp-wise, you might end up with one knot, but based on the 15 seconds that you set your relay to treb, you might have to put four out. And why would I set? 15 amp my relay because I want to coordinate with the relay ahead of that. So get into all these coordination. Yeah, no problem. Shift your relay to 15 seconds, but then that will will cause you um, that, that will cause you higher conductors so they can't burn. I'm not saying that you set them at 16 seconds though. Um, the same thing feeders, guys. If you look at uh, for feeders, here's the fuse. Back to what you said for your fuse three times. When we size the conductor for circuit breaker six times, and there's some feeder tabs and so forth. Um, if you have a neutral, if you have a neutral, guys, um, they allow you to use a 600 volt insulation for the neutral. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about the grounding. <laughs> so we have. Uh, um, when it comes to the grounding, guys, you, you can do solidly. You're, we're all familiar with solidly grounded system. That's very familiar. So your solidly grounded system is option one. Ungrounded system is option two. Or impedance grounded system is option option three. So if you have um, impedance grounded system, so you're going to basically, you guys, this is, becomes a big deal. I don't think it's ever used in the low voltage. Anybody have seen impedance grounded in 600 volts or less? It's usually 41 you do. Impedance grounded. At 41, like 600 or less. How much? 480. 480, okay. Impedance grounded, where you put an impedance, you limit the ground fault into the three phase fault to clear it. Maybe because of a high ground fault area. Okay. 
to limit the current. So if you limit ground fault, um, now obviously for us, we can no problem. If you put impedance, guys, then you can't use a neutral on it. So for the for most of commercial industrial building, you don't use a neutral anyway, uh, a medium voltage neutral. Um, if you were to do this, generator and neutral grounding, uh, you can do it on uh, motors, you can do it on a network feeder, uh, but here's a couple of requirements that have to be no, here's my favorite, no line to neutral loads, which is we care less because we're taking 13.8 in this case. And a neutral have to be identified and in neutral, unlike the solidly grounded neutral where I can use a six, I use a THH conductor on a solidly grounded 13.8 because it's rated for 600 volt. Unlike solidly grounded system, here you have to use um, a voltage neutral fully insulated so 15k neutral 15k phase 15 if you are solidly if you're not solidly grounded um, in 2011 and I there's a lot of stuff in 2011 guys only in 2011 they came and told us how to do that there are two types of ground you guys are very all of you are familiar with it grounding in a third conductor and um, grounding electrode equipment ground conductor and grounding electrode conductor. We always did them in um, in high voltage, but in 2011, they told you no problem. Go ahead and use table 250.66, the one that we have been using all the time. Yes, sir. Oh, 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 boy. I know. Okay, signing sheet, guys. I know you were approaching here. I'm going to pass. Uh, um, there is Wisconsin here and Minnesota as well as Iowa. So I'm going to start and please circulate that as you go through. I'm sorry, you sir. Yeah, I'm very good. So make sure you get signed in. So keep it, uh, keep you moving. Thank you. So finally, I don't know how you guys did that. As an engineers, if you need one art, we put for art. And um, if you guys have done for the utilities, did you, anybody, the ones who do medium voltage, um, Ground mat, Lisa, do you guys do ground mat analysis on the substation where they run short circuit, they put grounding, ground grid in the substation, and they run based on the ground mat analysis, they can come up with the size of the conductor that you need. I did it when we were, so yeah, ground from the substations. So this is not gonna take the place of it, guys. This is mostly for if you have a, a medium voltage switch gear in your building. So how do you size a grounding electrode conductor? Exactly like we do it for low voltage. Unless you're an engineer doing a switch gear or switch yard for utilities, you're gonna go to table, the magic table, 250.66. And oh, by the way, do not go list them four and six being aluminum and copper. <laughs> so that's four and six. These are the only limitation. And anyway, we don't go list than six in a grounding electrode conductor in the low voltage, do we? We don't go list. There's eight, but if you put eight, then you have to protect it, right? So most of us go six anyway. So there's really no difference between pulling the grounding electrode conductor. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that was a change for grounding electrode conductor. Um, equipment grounding conductor, guys, the same thing. They can tell you, please don't go list than number six, number four, and you can go to the same table that we use for 600, the same table. You guys remember 250.122, same table that we use for low voltage. Can I use the shielded cable as my grounding conductor? Now, the shield, cables are shielded. Medium voltage cables, for the most part, are shielded with some exceptions. If your shield is rated to clear the fault in terms of amps and time, then you can use the shield of the cable as an equipment grounding conductor. Now, the shield has to be grounded. That's we put the shield and we ground the shield from one side. If you ground the shield from both sides, you're acting as an equipment grounding conductor. Then it has to be rated to clear the fault. So unless your shield is rated to clear the fault, then with a brand circuit or a feeder, you have to pull a separate equipment grounding conductor. So that's what they're saying. Um, if you're using a metallic tape, this is not rated as an equipment ground conductor. If you have metallic tape shield versus um, metallic ins insulation shield, um, so metallic tape, don't think about it. Metallic shield, make sure it's rated to clear the fall at the right end and for the right time. Otherwise, you're going to throw an equipment grounding conductor with the circuit, with an equipment grounding conductor. I believe that would be in this cable right in here.
And then it talks about, guys, a couple of things about using MC cable. Um, it, you know, if you're using an MC cable to provide an effective grounding conductor, there's a couple of things that you have to do. And I'm going to spare you that one. So the shield of the cable, you guys are very familiar with this. Uh, you take the shield of the cable and you have to ground it directly into your grounding electrode system, right? The shield. Anybody can look at the color code on the cables and tell me why are they using this color code? This is, by the way, from IBA, International Association of Electrical Inspector Picture. Any comments on the color code? You see the color? Red, white, and blue. Does that sound familiar to you? Red, is that, is that how, so phase A, phase B, phase C? Is that color code we use? Now, I had this one in my code update class, and they always comment on it. Um, anybody knows why they use this way? Utilities. Thank you. Utilities. I got confused myself until you read this book. The utilities, that's a standard color. Then I start walking around and look at the riser, so-called riser, the cable coming from the power lines all the way down, they call them risers. If you guys look at them, you're going to find red, white, and blue. Red, white, and blue is the stand, one standard for the utilities for phase A, phase B, and phase C. So, and we all know what white means in the low voltage, right? So if this is a utility switch gear, if it's not a utility switch gear, you can't, uh, you have to color code it. The ungrounded conductor cannot be white, right? That's a violation of the code. So it's interesting too. Okay, so uh, feeders, this is an interesting, as I'm gonna go, and I know our time is up here. You, when you size a feeder, if, and I can email you guys this one. When you size a feeder, you take the transformer nameplate and you add 125% of your utilization equipment, that motor or whatever you're running, and then you size your feeder. Um, or, or supervised installation can be done by qualified people like yourself sizing it. Like you just said, you size but 1.25. You're qualified to size 1.25. So here's your branch circuit looks like this. The same thing for branch circuit, guys, 125% of um, the load, they don't have transformers because usual branch circuit don't have going to a motor or something, and, or they allow smart people like yourself to size it otherwise. So we're engineers, I always say, guys, we always can do a little bit of things as long as we can sign our PE next to it, and we're willing to go to court if it burns, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> um, MV cable, this talks about the shield and all this stuff, and I'm going to let you, insulation level, guys, they talk about 100, 133, and 175, um, and this is, I'm going to take you directly into uh, sizing the ambicity, remember um, amp calc, I don't know if amp calc, they changed their name now, um, if you go SKM, PTW, guys, and you, size, you can size your conductor as an engineer. Look at the engineering supervision. You can do anything you want. You can size the conductor the way you want, you know, under engineering supervision. Um, if, you're, if you want to follow the, well, if you, otherwise, you can go to the tables. And this is just a really nice summary, guys, of using um, the ambicities, which ambicity used where. If you're not familiar with this, again, I, because of the time, I can email it to you. Really nice summary of all the tables and which you guys are familiar with these details, um, concrete in case dots or, or dirt in case dots um, or directly buried cables, multi-conductor cable, single conductor cable, all these details can give you which table to go to if you are to science. For example, I have a, here, I have a three phase, three, uh, two three phase circuits, branch circuit or feeders. Each one of them is a single conductor cable. Here's the table that you can go to find the amp for each this each one of these conductors under these circumstances. Okay, so um, we talked about this one, guys, finding the voltage based on the voltage and the ambicity correction factor. And uh, here's the details. If you're not familiar with these details and you're on the low voltage, maybe I know. So these details, guys, are a big deal. You can have one dot encased in concrete or dirt. And that's how you find it, one duct with one cable or one multi-conductor cable, or one multi-conductor cable. And all these details, I put them for you. I know my time's up here. Um, 
ambient temperature correction. The, for the first time there is in history, we have at least an NDC code book. We can correct the temperature for the high voltage cable. You either, uh, Lisa, my friend, you can go and use this formula, or they give you a table, guys. This is a newly introduced table to correct for for uh, voltage uh, for uh, cable tree. And it went. This this is nicely done um, cable tray, guys. If you use a cable tray, we have meter voltage. It's summarized. Where do you put, how do you size a conductor is based on which table. And like, for example, if you put, um, you have to derate. it. If you don't put spaces like here, you jam them all next to each other. You have to multiply whatever value you got by 75%. Again, I can't emphasize, guys, because of the time. Um, let me know if I can go over that one. And um, so that's that's all we're gonna do. I have another hundred, uh, almost close to a couple of uh, slides to go. If you guys want this one, I would thank you guys for attending my class. I will invite you to visit my YouTube channel. This will be on YouTube channel tonight. Um, and uh, and if you guys want um, my business card, I have business cards right here. If you want a PDF of this, grab a business card, drop me an email, or go to YouTube, drop me an email and I'll uh, forward you the PDF. Thank you guys and enjoy the show. Thank you. Thank you.